news is that the good stuff is going to be recorded. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Terry. Thanks. Thanks, Ro. Thanks. And uh, so before I get started, I, I do want to call out. So one of the guys that's called in tonight, I, I saw Tom call in earlier. So I know Tom's on mute right now, but uh, Tom played a very, very key role. Uh, he was the one that actually found CPR 694. He's out of Duluth, Minnesota. So welcome, Tom. Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more later on. Um, so uh, this was this is probably what I'll categorize as the most expensive dive I ever did because it required me to go out and get a rebreather and get rebreather certified. So um, we're gonna we're gonna cover I'm gonna take a little tour tonight. I've got uh, three items. I got a PowerPoint presentation that kind of walks through uh, CPR six ninety four. I then have a video that we're gonna, a couple of videos actually. One is called The Ties That Bind. And I wanted to show that one. It was done by a group out of Toronto to basically celebrate the Canada 150, uh, 150th birthday of Canada and a tie in with uh, CPR, uh, the, the railroad and the finishing of the railroad along the North Shore. And uh, I, I think that's important because it really adds some, some color and some depth to kind of what we were doing because right around that time is when we were when we were up looking for the locomotive so some of our some of that video got used in the uh, in the ties that bind so i think it really gives some some texture to it and then finally we'll do some some raw footage at the very end and uh, then we'll open up for questions and, and answers so <clears throat> first of all i'm going to get my powerpoint going here okay so cpr 694 um i i will tell you right up front that PowerPoint's not not my favorite thing it's not something I'm really good at I could either learn how to do PowerPoint or I could go diving so this is what you get for the PowerPoint sadly um, we're going to talk about uh, the, a little bit with the CPR 694 we're going to talk about the sinking we're going to talk about the location of it there was two separate years worth of expeditions that were done and then the video at the end so a little bit about the locomotive itself <clears throat> it was built in February 1906, and it was built uh, by the Locomotive and Machine Company in, in Montreal. The builder's number was 735, but the road number was 694. And it was what they called a Class D10 coal steam locomotive. So these locomotives, there was, at its heyday, there was over 500 of these in use by uh, CPR, Canadian Pacific Railway. <clears throat> and the D-10 locomotives operated from the 1800s, I'm sorry, the 1880s, right through till as late as 1960. So these, these had a really long life before they were finally retired uh, with, with diesel locomotives. So this locomotive is what they called a 10-wheeler locomotive, and it had what they called a 460 arrangement. And if you kind of look down at the, just the, the model uh, of the train down below, it meant that there was four leading wheels on two axles. Quite often those were called the bogey wheels. There were six powered and coupled drive wheels on three separate axles, the main, the main drive wheels. And then usually the, there was a set of wheels, there may or may not be wheels underneath the cab itself. So this one did not have what they called trailing wheels. So the locomotive itself was 46 feet long or 14 meters. And with the coal car, it was 64 feet long or 19 meters. So the, the picture you see here below the, or the model that the photograph of the model would show you about 64 feet long. So you kind of think about that in terms of a lot of shipwrecks we dive. That, that's a pretty small, that's a pretty small thing. Uh, weight of the locomotive was 205,000 pounds or 93,000 kilos. And it had a tractive force of 33,300 pounds or 15,000 kilos. What was interesting with steam locomotives was they could actually generate more horsepower as they increased with speed. So their goal was to get up to, you know, get up to a fairly fast speed, some, you know, somewhere around 35 miles an hour. So a little bit about the sinking. This all happened on June 10th, 1910. So if you've ever been in Lake Superior in June, it's extremely cold. A lot of times the ice is just kind of coming off the lake 
uh, around the end of May, early June. So very cold. The train had a locomotive, a coal car, and two freight cars. There was three people uh, running it. There was the engineer, Frank Wheatley, the fireman, E. Clark, and the brakeman, uh, J. McMillan. So they were traveling between uh, Whitefish, I'm sorry, Jackfish, and, uh, and heading towards Marathon when they came upon uh, a certain tunnel. And McMillan had noticed a rock side on the track right before the mink tunnel. And he engaged the brakes and jumped from the train. Based on kind of what we saw underwater, we think what happened was when the locomotive hit the, the rocks on the track that the, the, the bogey wheels kind of collapsed under the locomotive and the main, the main structure of the locomotive lifted right off from the track. The train then fell 65 feet or 20 meters off the cliff into the water. Uh, Wheatley was thrown from the locomotive. His body, his body was found on the surface but Clark's body was never, ever recovered. And then McMillan, he actually jumped and then he, he died on a, you know, again, it's, he, there's a 65 foot cliff there that takes you down to the water. So it was a bad night all around. 40 meters of track were destroyed and it shut down the vital West East CPR line. The thing that made it challenging was that the telegraph poles were also knocked down. So nobody really knew what had happened until the train was late getting into Marathon. So people started to wonder what was happening. And when they started to look, they realized the train had derailed and gone into the lake. Sadly, the tragedy was, was soon forgotten. So a lot, a lot kind of happened in those years between 1910 and 1914. So, you know, the very, when we were just talking about this, but the very next year in August, 1911, the Ganilda sank up in that same section of Lake Superior. The Titanic sank in uh, April 1912. We were just talking about that tonight. And then Empress of Ireland sank in May of 1914. And then the First World War was declared in July of 1914. So sadly for everybody else other than, you know, the local people up in that part of Lake Superior, you know, CPR was, was, was pretty quickly forgotten. So to kind of give you an idea of where this is, because Lake Superior is a pretty big lake when you start to try to drive around it or spend time on it. Um, we've, so we've got a, a section there, Marathon, and then to, to the west of that, you got Scriber. And you're kind of right in between those two spots. And if you look at the, the exploded area down below, there's what they call Mink Harbor, and it was the Mink Tunnel that it was heading towards when it derailed. So some of these photos are um, my, my dive buddy, Dave Ferguson, who lives in Windsor. Dave had, Dave had either the misfortune or the, or the fortune of being unemployed when we were doing our expedition in 2016. So he really had a chance to dig in and do a lot of, a lot of research um, on this. And this was some of, the, some of the early photographs that were taken. And it doesn't really look too different than that today, other than there's... Uh, the, the trussels have all been filled in, as you see on the kind of the right hand side, those trussels have been filled in with rock. Uh, so this was some of the, the rail fare enterprises, Montreal, this was some, some stock uh, photographs here. So this was the tunnel in the spring of 1885 after the main line was completed. Um, this is kind of what it looks like today. So kind of were that over to the right hand side of the photo there where you've got um, the rocks kind of come up pretty high as where the mink tunnel is today, but that essentially that same track. But what you can see there is, is that wall kind of goes up. It goes up several hundred feet to the, if, if the, tr if the train is traveling east, then the rock walls to your left. And if you're traveling west, it's to your, to your right. So the photograph, thanks to Dave Ferguson for that. Um, so this is where we've, you know, we were kind of we were kind of silly because we we we've been up diving. This photo is uh, on the far right is, is Paul Turpin and Paul's lived up in in Rossport pretty much all his life, and uh, we did a lot of diving with Paul. Really started from the late 1990s all the way through to when we started looking for the train. And 
every year we go up and we dive the Ganelda, we dive the Judge Hart. And one day we said to Paul, Paul, is there anything else up here to dive? He says, well, there's this locomotive over by the Mink Tunnel. You know, um, some, some, some say you can see it from, you know, from the, from the top of the cliff if you're looking down. So we, we, in 2014, we decided, well, let's, let's go see if we can find this, this locomotive. So there was just a few of us and we, we really had no idea what, what we were doing or where we we're gonna, we knew where the, we had a pretty good sense of where the train had gone off the track, but we didn't really know anything else in terms of depth or anything. So we did, we did three dives in the site. All dives were com completed in open circuit scuba. Um, so what people had claimed that they saw the locomotive when they were climbing the cliff, th those were the bogey wheels that were in about 30 feet or 10 meters of water. So unfortunately, the rest of the terrain was, was significantly deeper than that. Um, in one of the dives, I think it was the second dive, we did find some wreckage that we thought was part of the cab, and that was at about 210 feet or 65 meters. In the very last dive of the day, we were, uh, Greg Hilliard and I were on scooters, and we found one of the box cars at 285 feet. So these are, this is kind of the, some pictures of the bogey wheels. So these were quite shallow. We could, we could, we could spot them pretty much right from the surface. Um, this part here, you can kind of make out if you kind of look in the sort of the middle area here, it looks like a bit of a doorway or maybe a window and a, you know, a bit of a roof cover here, which we thought might've been the cabin. And then the last, the last dive of the day we were the last dive of the, the expedition, we found the box car. And um, this was actually a still photograph. And for those of you that, if you haven't dove Lake Superior, Lake Superior is quite clear, but it's very dark. You get down about 150, 160, and you pretty much lose ambient light. So I was kind of the silly one. I'm on a dive propulsion vehicle or a scooter. And all I had for lighting was the aiming lights on my, my flash strobe. So I'm I'm kind of scootering around in the dark with these massive boulders everywhere. And I was, all I could do is follow Greg's light. And he was the one that actually spotted it. So we actually set up the camera and, uh, and it got a couple shots before we headed, headed back up. So um, I know Ro had mentioned that I, I do some writing for Quest. It's a, it's a magazine out of Florida that Global Underwater Explorers. So we documented, uh, that particular trip and kind of what we had found, uh, you know, we hadn't found much. We found a box car, but we were pretty excited. And uh, I never thought anybody ever read those magazines, uh, but but apparently people do read those magazines. So there was some there was some interest, you know, gathering up on on maybe trying to find this locomotive. So there, there had been we did get some interest. So we took 2015 off. And I really can't remember why we did that, um, but I think it was work related. The one thing we realized when we found the box car and the depth at which we found it was we were pretty much pushing the limits of what we could do on open circuit. So we were, you know, we were using a big set of doubles and, you know, uh, decompression gases and so on. But we really were, we really were pushing it and we thought if the box car was at 285 feet, then, then probably the locomotive would be deeper because it was much heavier and we thought it would have rolled farther down, down the cliff. So Paul had actually, his, from his side scan, we were, we were literally you know, 75, 75 meters from shore. It drops off to 500 feet there. So it is, it is extremely deep. So in 2015, actually, we decided that if we were going to do any more exploration of this, then what we probably need to do is get on closed circuit scuba, so rebreathers. So we did that in 2015, spent some time getting proficient on closed circuit. But the other thing that was, was handy was that, uh, so Ron Benson, uh, that one of the names there was our, was our instructor on the closed circuit. And uh, we had the great fortune to meet Tom Crossman out of Duluth and you know, Tom, Tom's, Tom's profession now is he spends time with an ROV and most of what he does is he looks for things that are lost in the bottom, looks for 
people that are lost in the bottom. He does a lot of work on recoveries. And I don't know, you, you may or may not remember the, the little boy that was lost in the St. Lawrence River there a few years ago, that tragedy. Uh, it, it was Tom that came down, um, really volunteered a lot of his time to, to help find, locate the, you know, the, the poor boy on the bottom. So we were very fortunate in 2016 that we had a tremendous amount of help. So we, we kind of had a combined U.S. American team to kind of really put some, put some focus to it. Um, so this is kind of a, a photo that we took at the end. Uh, it included the, the, the people that were on our dive team, but it also included a lot of people from the town of Scriber. The, I can't say enough about the folks from Scriber because they really, they were really interested in this. And the big, there's two big, so, so to give you a perspective, I'm on the, I'm on the, on the left side there and I'm 6'3". And then you see that there's two big giants over on the right-hand side. There's one guy with the baseball cap on is Dave Slanker. And then uh, the other guy is Bob Krause. And Bob Krause was the former mayor of Scriber. But Scriber was a town that was developed for the railroad. And everybody that was in that town worked on the railroad. So they had a huge interest in what was going on and really supported us as much as they could with, you know, shore support and things like that. So in 2016, um, we had, uh, Tom had our, our numbers, our numbers for the, for the box car. And on July 22nd, 2016, Tom was, was able to find the, the main locomotive engine uh, using, using his ROV. So first images in 106 years were released. Uh, first dives were actually done that, that day with, by uh, Ron Benson, Dave Slanker, and, and Todd Jankert. Uh, video and photos were taken. Um, myself, Blair Mott, and Dave Ferguson were up kind of the following weekend. Um, and at that time, Blair had Blair located the second box car. Um, so we were we were pretty excited about that. And then we had the entire team kind of around for the August August twenty second to twenty six. So we had dives completed by a number of dive team members. Video and photos were taken. All the dives at that point were completed on rebreathers, and Tom was around for that and helped help do some further exploration with the ROV and and uh, his his primary focus on that one was to see if we could find the coal car. And as yet, we have yet to find the coal car, and that's something we would be keen to to try and find. But it might be it might be deeper yet than than what we're what we're seeing. So. The train itself, it lies in 245 feet of water, 75 meters. It's lying on its port side facing west away from the main tunnel. So somehow from when it was traveling east, it ended up on the bottom going west. The cab has been ripped off, but what you'll see on the video is that it's very intact. All six of the main drive wheels with the drive arms are intact and attached to the train. The main boiler section is intact. Uh, the boiler plate is missing. The bell is missing, but the bell holder is still attached to the locomotive uh, and the smokestack is missing. So we really had no idea what we were gonna come across. We thought this thing, you know, with a hot boiler, it might've just exploded and just been, you know, debris, but it's, it's surprisingly intact. So Dave Ferguson, I kind of mentioned him a little bit earlier. Dave, Dave belongs to the Explorers Club. And so it's a, it's a, it's a fairly prestigious club. You know, I, I can't belong to it cause I don't, I don't have a tuxedo. Um, but uh, Dave applied for, you know, and we, we almost did it as just kind of a lark. Dave applied to see if he could get an Explorers Club flag for, uh, for this particular expedition. And sure enough, he got flag 211 on May 23rd, 2016. So the flag was, the flag was bittersweet. Uh, it was cool having the flag and it prompted us to one of the things we had to do when we were done was we had to generate a formal report that would sit in the library in New York City with the Explorers Club. Um, so the sad thing about the flag was, um, you know, we had we had some we had some people on the team that kind of went a bit, got a bit starstruck and, and, and thought they should be hanging on to the flag and 
Everybody wanted to pitch it with the flag. The only person that really didn't care whether she held on to the flag or not was Elisa. So she was the one that got to carry the flag and get a photo on the locomotive with it. So as far as, as, far as I can tell, uh, Alicia Hilliard is still the only woman that stove CPR 694. So for all you ladies out there, something to, uh, something to do. Um, so then we did, you know, because, you know, when you, when you write, when you write magazine articles for free, they always want you to write an article for them. Uh, so we did a, we did a follow-up article, um, which was, which was featured in, in Quest magazine as well. A little, my little tie in for, for GUE, I guess. So, um, so that's kind of it. This last photo, I, I, I always like this photo because it was kind of nice. It had, it had Tom's, Tom's ROV on there. And I, I tell you, it was kind of, it actually felt kind of reassuring when we were down on the bottom. Not that Tom could help us at all, but it was kind of cool having, knowing he could see what we were up to. So that's the PowerPoint. What I was gonna do at this point was um, the ties that bind, I'm gonna kind of go into that. It mostly talks about the, the completion of the railroad and that section along the North shore. But I believe it's important because it kind of sets the, the backdrop quite nicely for, for our video. Okay. Well, the, the train left here late in the evening, just the one steam engine, the one crew. Well, you gotta watch the rocks. The mountains. There's hills here that will go against you. You've got cliffs that go up maybe five, six hundred feet. So about four o'clock in the morning or so, they're doing approximately about 35 miles an hour. And the next thing they would have saw was this rock slide. If you are wondering why you are watching a Canadian railway story, and it isn't the one about the very last spike, that's understandable. Craigie Lockie had that picture-perfect Kodak moment. This story had few cameras about, but what happened along the north shore of Lake Superior was equally monumental. Canada was uh, all in parts, really, until the railroad came through and joined everything. Sections of track had been constructed all over the country, but it wasn't possible for a train to go coast to coast and stay in Canada. There was lots of track laid west of Thunder Bay, but uh, this location here on the North Shore of Lake Superior was a big holdup, which is why you have this monument east of town here, like where east met west. Early route plans favored connecting east and west by going south of Lake Superior going through the United States. But they decided once uh, they got in the, the Sudbury area, okay, we're, we're going directly northwest up to Lake Superior and over top of it because the, the railway needed to stay in, in Canada. Well, this section through here that made it Canadian was a, probably one of their toughest um, sections to put through because of the terrain. They followed the north shore of Lake Superior through this area, which was a very rugged piece of land. And uh, being at that time, everything was done by hand. No roads, no towns. Now imagine no power tools. The Trans-Canada Highway, like here in Nipigon, parallels the original 1880 CPR route. In 2017, 130 years after the railway was built, new highway lanes are being added. They're just a short distance from the tracks and cut through identical rock. Look at the machinery involved. Now imagine doing this by hand. What they would do is they'd have two fellas on a hammer and one fella turning the drill every time the hammer hit, he'd have to rotate the drill a quarter of a turn. You had to trust the fella on the hammer if you were holding the drill. I uh, must have been one heck of a job, I'll tell you. You sit there all day and bang on a hammer with a bit on the end of it, and maybe gets five or six feet in a day by hand. I don't know. <laughs> they would be a lot of holes because the uh, they used black powder at the time, and the rock had to be small enough that they could move it 
basically by hand. Like wherever there was an open space, they built trestles, and then later years they dumped and filled over the trestles, and the trestles are still in the ground underneath the rock. When they couldn't go over the uneven terrain, they'd go through it. When I look at that, and I'm going through that, when I was when I was running trains, I used to wonder how the mountain basically stayed there when they blasted the original hole, because there's so much material above it. You know, it, it makes you wonder how they were able to do it in the first place. Well, they worked dusk till dawn. As soon as the sun started to move, you know, were up without adder until it would turn dark. And... Well, it must have been awful hard because. Uh... Uh, you know, there was no restaurants or that. You went to the camp and you ate what the cook fed you, and if you didn't like it, well, you were SOL, you know? <laughs> and I imagine it was, uh, it was deplorable, like the smell and everything else compared to today. You wouldn't even think about anything like that. And that wasn't all. The temperature soared in summer and plummeted in winter. When I started on the railroad, the uh, temperature of minus 60 degrees was, was in the norm in the White River area. And uh, we worked in the minus 50 and 60 weather with trains. The brutal amount of work eased as locomotives brought steam power to the forward section. But every summer, the insects arrived. Mom had uh, stuff that she made up in the house to stop the bugs from killing us, but uh, I, I imagine back in the uh, 1850s, it must have been really, really bad with them mosquitoes because they are a real bugger. They're, they were bad, real bad. You got to use a lot of McCurdy's. You got to cover yourself with McCurdy's and sometimes bear grease. You got to put a lot of bear grease on them, I'll tell you the truth, because if you stop working, They'll, they'll eat you alive, so you gotta keep on going. And keep on going they did. This 200 kilometer section of railway had been called an engineering impossibility, but its completion was crucial to the vision of Canada. This interesting little piece of history is a surveyor's roll, and it's all made out of cloth. Um, this particular roll is approximately 35 feet long and it shows all the elevations of the railroad, the bridges, uh, soil types, everything. Bottom line is this little piece of history is actually paper that turned the railroad into the real rails. Years ago, we were isolated 100% until the railroad came along. It tied the east to the west with, without any doubt at all. Uh, what people have got to understand is the way it was done with the sidings. With only one track for trains going either direction, sidings were needed to allow one train to pull over while another passed. At every siding from Scriber to White River that I know, there was a station. And each station had a man living at it working there and they usually lived there with their wife and their children and each one of these stations were just like jackfish that's what these people did that's what kept the railroad tied from east to west in our town of jackfish there was probably uh, 30 or 40 houses but remember big family in our family there was nine of us and the guy down the street he had 12 you know these section men built the railroad and kept it going it's uh, that simple with the CPR, Jackfish had grown from a remote fishing village to an important fuel depot for locomotives. The ships could brought coal in there for storage and shipped to Scriber and Shaplow and all over for the steam engines. And I never missed any ship or boat coming. And back in those days, nobody had cameras who couldn't afford it. So we don't have many pictures of anything. Next door to Scriber, Rossport took advantage of lots of winter ice and the new rail line to get fresh Lake Superior fish to southern markets. They would go and cut the ice out of the lake and they would stock it into the uh, ice house so that the, when the passenger train came along, they could put it into their 
dining car to keep the food cold. Northern fish destined for markets in Toronto and Montreal no longer needed to be smoked to make the journey. Well, it was critically important. Once the railway came, as uh, uh, fish were packed in these boxes, and I stopped good. And then we put it on the carts for the express train during the night. They had refrigerated cars to take it to Montreal and Toronto. But even as times changed and life became more routine, this remained a sometimes harsh environment that could quickly extract a hefty toll from a tightly knit community. Well, the, the train left here late in the evening, June the 9th, 1910. So about four o'clock in the morning or so, they're going through Coldwell, which is a siding there. And the train is sliding around a left-hand curve. And the next thing they would have saw was this rock slide, you know, huge boulders. The engine ended up veering to the right, got knocked to the right. And the pony wheels were probably ripped off the engine and down the embankment they went, along with two boxcars. They wouldn't have seen what was about to happen for very long, half a dozen seconds or so, at that speed. Decades later, a dedicated deep water dive team with new search technologies helped find the wreck of 694 in 235 feet of water. Because the fireman's body was never found. The group here in Scriber that chartered a boat and they had a burial at sea ceremony back in 1910. A loss like the wreck of engine 694 would touch everyone on this thin strip of community, this extended family. I uh, worked on the railroad and uh, my great grandfather worked on the railroad, my grandfather, my father, and my children. In those days, everybody worked for the railroad. The brothers, the sisters, the neighbors, everybody. It was just a family oriented uh, uh, place. We were connected to the CPR because we worked there. We did a lot of things there. Some of our old people used to work on the coal docks and you know, on the coal ships for the steam engines. We used to be fishing guides. They used to advertise in the trains, they wanted wonderful lakes to come fishing. And they used to have our people being guides on the trains. When I was born, my parents and all my family came up by the train. That's what they tell me. And they would come home by the train. People would travel by the train. There was no roads here. <laughs> there was no roads. All you had to have is a, a canoe or a train. Everyone was proud of their railway, proud of the work their families had done in tying the country together. Everybody looked after what they had and they were proud of the C.P. Logan with the beaver on it. I worked in the roundhouse and we used to, they bring the old steam engines in and we had to wipe them all down with a sort of a varsol and oil, make them clean. And it used to be nice too to, to go to the roundhouse and uh, to go in there and see all those beautiful locomotives all sitting there, and each one in a stall, you know. And beautiful to see, you know. And, uh, so I still think of it, how lucky I was to be able to move one of those steam engines. <laughs> and I was only a kid then, 18, 19 years old. They are a magnificent machine, a magnificent machine. I used to watch the steam pop, them, and the smoke coming out of the chimney. They were just beautiful and they were huge. Watch them and take off and the steam and the smoke and the noise. Well, the, the steam was gushing out of them uh, from both sides and, and the black smoke was flying up from the top from the coal tenders. I just fell in love with the terrain and, and I took a, a lot of pride in doing that job and uh, I really just loved it. There wasn't two trips the same. The lake was maybe like glass going up today and come back this afternoon, the waves would be three or four feet high. Sometimes the waves washed right up, splashed right up on the track. Every trip was uh, like going on a little holiday and I, I enjoyed it. Many who visit this area exclaim, I had no idea this was here. It's spectacular. They might say, I had no idea what those people did. It's incredible. A fully Canadian east-west link that ensured Canada would be one.
It's just what it did. It tied the east to the west. It tied Canada together right across from uh, Montreal right through to Vancouver. It made us united. It made us one. It made us a whole nation. Sir John A. was on the bit when he done that, built the railroad. 5,000 horses, at least 410,000 railway ties, and one and a half million spikes. The 12,000 men who built this section of railway came from everywhere, but worked as one. They not only tied the ends of a brand new country together, they left a uniquely Canadian imprint on the world that endures today. If I had to say one thing about the route through this part of Canada would be right up there with the Great Pyramids that were built. I would have to use that as an analogy. There would be no difference in the task that was done. I did want to thank uh, Tom McCullen for allowing me to share that. So the last, last little bit, we'll show you the, the actual video that we, we shot. It's, it's not too long, but we'll pull that up. Looks good. <clears throat> so this was, the, this was the model of the, the train that Doug Stafurik had made, exact replica which was really great for us when we were trying to trying to reference things that we were seeing on the bottom. Just trying to get into some video here. So one of the things that's amazing, there, there is a lot of debris, but sort of the first thing you come across when you hit the bottom is you, you see the dry, you know, the main, the main wheels. We actually did um, tie a line to it. You got a, a surface float but we also have some, some cave line that allows us to reference it from shore. <clears throat> but what you can see here is how, how intact, all those drive arms, all the drive wheels are completely intact. Superior is awesome in the sense that there are absolutely no muscles. So everything you see is, you know, there'll be a bit of silt, but you can see, make out a lot of detail. We're happy to see Tom keeping an eye on us. Kind of working our way at this point towards um, back of the locomotive. So this is where the, the cab would have been. The cab's been ripped off, but you can kind of see the throttle. And then uh, 
being curious, I had to stick my camera in the firebox and then proceeded to get it stuck in there. And then if we get back out. So that's where they would have stoked the boilers. So we're gonna kind of move forward. And you can see a little bit of the cab section here. So this would have been the front part of the cab where the engineer would have looked out. But what's amazing is that main boiler section is completely intact. You can see all, all the rivets are still there. And for it to survive that falling down the cliff and then rolling down in the water to land in 245 feet is pretty remarkable. There's the bell holder there. I know Tom and I have been really keen to try and find that bell. We really would love to find that. Where the smokestack used to be. And then the very front. So you can see where it kind of impacted. This area here, where the bogey wheels used to be. So the bogey wheels were just kind of the main locomotive, there was a pin system that attached to the bogey wheels and it just held it on by gravity. So we tried to get a little bit of video of kind of the drive section underneath. So our visibility here was probably about 40 feet. You can see it's, it's pretty dark, but it's still pretty clear. The other thing you kind of make out here is you see the boulders, and these boulders are absolutely massive. And the locomotive itself is kind of it's kind of cradled. It's kind of in the center of a bunch of boulders, and that's why we think that you know, had we not had Tom not been part of the, the group, I don't know that we would have ever found it. We could have easily scooted over top of it and not seen it. You know, it just it's kind of recessed in these boulders. There's some more, more structure. Some of the stuff that we've identified on this locomotive on the video, we since sent to people that actually know what locomotives are all about. And there's some changes I need to make on a few of the nomenclatures. I think at the back, I, I called something a break and it wasn't but something else. This is what we thought was a break, but it's actually something something else. So we got that. Uh, we got to make some changes here in this video. So this is heading down to the second box car. Now this one's this is we're about 285 feet here, and so you can see the box cars got pretty badly bashed up. What one of the things that we never ever found searching the CPR archives was what this train was actually carrying. There's obviously no cargo in the in the uh, in the freight car anymore. There was a bunch of large like 12 inch diameter tubes it almost looked like ducting kind of scattered as we go back up the wall but there was never there was never when when CPR moved its head office from Toronto to Montreal a lot of records were lost so we weren't we weren't able to kind of determine what it was carrying. So it's, it's lying on its side. So there's nothing nothing in it. Some of the some of the structures there, some of it's been just ripped clean clean off. It's remarkable we can still you know still see the color in the wood all those that sort of thing other than a little bit of silk there's, there's really nothing no muscles at all as i said so 
I'm going to kind of come back to the front of the box car here now and you'll see the coupling knuckle that would have attached to the coal car. This would have been the front or maybe the back. We'll see the, we'll see the knuckle here in a second. Just boulders, huge boulders everywhere. So there's a coupling, knuckle coupler, what they called it. Just a few key photos to finish it out. So we actually got a chance to take the, the scriber flag down, which we thought was appropriate, we needed to do. The very last day, we actually found an old boot and we were tying cave line to get our way back to the surface. We just happened to come across that boot at the very end. And that kind of represents what we did on our summer vacation in 2016. Terry, that was wonderful. That was amazing. It, it, it's, uh, it's, it's so much how much uh, an event can impact history and, and vice versa. It's great to hear the story behind the event, the images and the places that were, were there. I, I didn't expect this tonight. So uh, just hearing about the people as well, that was amazing. Uh, you should definitely get yourself a tuxedo if that's the uh, only thing keeping you <laughs> from becoming an explorer. So I'd, I'd, I'd much sooner spend time up on Lake Superior, to be honest with you. But uh, no, I was, it, you know, it was great. And I think, you know, and one of the things, and, and Tom will probably agree with me, was one of the things that was so cool about that was, especially the town folks at Scriber, they were so into this. They were so interested in what we were doing. And they really treat us well. And, you know, uh, the guy, Bob Krause, that was in the ties that bind the, the one guy that was the former mayor, <clears throat> you know, we, we would show, we would show him raw footage and he would start telling us stories about when he was working in the, in the roundhouse and he'd show us, you know, a big old bruised knuckle, you know, well, we used to, I used to have to do this on these drive arms and I'd always hit my <laughs> knuckle on it. So, you know, it was, it was that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, just that area superior. Um, is just, you know, the locomotive was just, was so important to them. It really, it was really the whole reason for it to be there. And everybody that lives on that North shore year round, that's, that's what they are involved in. It was, a, it was railroad society. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, it, it really gave us great insight of, to, you know, a completely different way of life. And, you know, it, it was something quite different than diving a shipwreck. You know, it was, uh, it was something completely different. So. Well, the, we, had lot, we had a lot of fun with it. The, the good thing is now that we have some people like yourself and Tom available to us now to ask uh, questions. So I would suggest that if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question from uh, the floor, or if you're not comfortable asking, you can put it in the chat and we can read it for you. So I think there was a... In the chats. Hey Terry. Yeah. Um, it's Hazen here. Um, so the I've got a bunch of questions actually. Um, so in 2014, you you guys found a box car at 285 feet. Yeah. How many dives did you guys take to figure out what depth to go after? After that trip or during that trip? During that trip. Well, we were, you know, again, we, we, we really, we didn't know what we were doing quite honestly. And I think what we, the, the way that that wall is set up is it's, you know, if you've ever been to Tobemore and you go to, you go to the Dufferin wall, it's, it's kind of like that, but it's, it's terrace. So you, you got a shallow section kind of like the Dufferin wall. It, it drops vertical down to about, about 180 feet, a little bit deeper than Dufferin terraced again, then it drops again. So, the first, the first couple of days we were down, you know, about 160, 180 feet. And we would see, 
like CPR, like hand carts. And it really what kind of what got us excited was we, I think the second day we were on it, we found the piece of that cab and we found those tubes that we were talking about. And so we thought, okay, we're, we're on to something, you know, and, uh, so we, 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 you know, we, we had gas mixed to 300 feet. So we thought we could go, we could hit as much as deep as 300 and that's as far as we'd go on open circuit. And so we just kind of, kind of went down and just started to, you know, serpentine back and forth. We had the benefit of scooters so we could cover ground fairly quickly, which it, it worked, it worked well for us. And it, it maybe worked against us too. You know, we could have very easily gone right over right over the locomotive in 2014 because and I know Tom's on so I'll let him talk to it as well but Tom where the box car where the box car was to where the train was it wasn't that far away you know but you know at, at that depth and with the lighting conditions you know 100 feet can seem a long way away even if you know even if you're on a scooter I guess but um, we were encouraged by what we saw at about 200 feet and we were just kind of trying to follow the natural topography and we kind of knew where it went, went off the track because <clears throat> even to this day you can kind of see some some deformation in the rock so we, we tried to we tried to get our profile to go down as close as we could kind of straight down that wall and um, you know we we, we, we kind of got lucky with the box car in 2014 and uh, so when when Tom went up in 2016 we said hey you know here's the numbers if you can you know, if you can find it, great, you know, let's just, you know, we just, we really would love to be able to, you know, provide something to the town of Scriber, you know, the, their long lost locomotive. And, uh, you know. Terry, if I remember right, it was uh, 181 feet from the box car to the locomotive. Okay. Um, and just, you know, just to be perfectly transparent here, Terry and I did not know each other uh, before this happened. So these guys took total trust in, in us and handed us their numbers. They had done all the hard work, um, you know, for me to put an ROV down with unlimited time, um, bottom time, and spend an hour down there with a sonar um, was pretty, pretty easy work for me. So let's be real clear here that the real heavy lifting on this was by Terry and his crew. Uh, I merely had a tool that could help them out but they blindly trusted me in giving me those numbers because I could have easily, um, once we found it, you know, went and did a, a release and said, hey, look what I did. And that was not the case. These guys did the heavy lifting. Um, we just merely brought another tool to, a, to it and we worked together on it. And I'm extremely humbled when I look at my name listed with these guys on this screen. I'm extremely humbled to have my name uh, associated with theirs. So let's just be honest, what, what you guys really did, Terry. <laughs> so Tom, when, the, when they first came across the box car at 285 feet, they believed that the, the locomotive could be deeper because that it's heavier, it's supposed to go deeper. How did you end up going backwards into shallower water? Just because of the size of the boulders. Of course, I had a multi-beam sonar, so I could see the size of the boulders around where these guys were kind of restricted in what they could see only by flashlight. So I could Got see it. boulders the size of a full-size pickup truck. And I thought, well, I don't know that it could get past those boulders. So when I started oh. to see those bigger boulders, I thought, no, it's gotta be back closer to shore. And sure enough, it was. Nice. Yeah, and I think that was, you know, again, you know, I know, I know, I know Tom likes to be humble about it, but you know, if Tom, if Tom hadn't, done that we we would have spent a number of dives on that trip at 300 yep. feet scooting around looking for something we would have never found so you know part of you know part of what tom what, what tom does is you know he's he's very clever at being able to determine you know piece together a puzzle and look for things you know whether it's whether it's body recoveries or you know all those kind of things so you know, it was, it, it was a really, you know, we, you know, as Tom said, we had not met, but, you know, we've, we've become pretty good friends and, you know, it was, a, it was a great, great experience. You know, it was a good, a really good team effort to, uh, to pull that together. And, you know, Tom was, Tom was really gracious because when they found it, they let us do the release on social media. And I remember, cause we released it that night about, I don't know, 1145, I think is when we put something on Facebook and, 
then then things went in a hurry after that it kind of exploded yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and a lot of that was out of our control yes yeah you know it was things things were being said and done that um neither terry's group or my group were necessarily involved in um so you know there was terry and i had made some phone conversations just making sure that i was being real clear with them that look, there's things being said that I'm taking credit and I, that's not the case. Um, I know what the truth is. You know what the truth is. It'd be foolish for me to do that. Um, so, I, and I didn't want that to happen. Yeah, the, the best article that was ever, the best article that was documented was done by a Andrew Krieger out of, yes. uh, out of the Duluth, Minnesota. He did a, he did a great write-up. And I remember he called, he talked to Tom because Tom, Tom lives in the same town as, as Andrew does. Yep. But Andrew, I remember talking to him on the phone on the drive up to Superior, and he was was going as far as making sure the spelling of everybody's name was correct, and he did a great job. The CBC just CBC did shit, quite honestly. They were awful. For, for something that we found <laughs> the year before the Canada 150, it was a complete disappointment. It really was. Uh, they, you know, the CBC had a great opportunity to really – you know, talk about, you know, tie in the Canada 150, tie in a really nice, you know, combined U.S. Canada expedition, you know, a significant artifact and they, they just blew it. You know, it was, a, you know, a dark I fully agree, <clears throat> you know, so if I, sorry, sorry if, yeah, if I ahead. heard it, if I heard it correctly on that, on that show that the video that you showed us, they quoted the train was at 235 and you found it at 245. Is that yeah, correct? they were, yeah, they're off. They're off. When, yeah. we, it's, it, I, when I, when I quote depths, I, I quoted it right off, right off my computer. So, but again, you know, we, we thought the train was going to be deeper. So we were, we were, we were kind of pleasantly surprised because, you know, our, the, the time we had a depth at 285 versus 245 is, you know, you start getting into those depths you know, one, one minute on the bottom is a significant decompression obligation. So um, when we were doing this in open circuit, we were, you know, it, it was, it was really all we could, all we could pull off, you know, it was right at the edge of what we could do. The rebreathers really, really helped with that, you know. So, was your bottom time between the 2014 and 16 similar? No, we were quite a bit longer in 2016. So we were, when we did, when we did the box car, I think we were pushing it. I think we did about 30 minutes on the bottom and we were about three, three hours total three hours our time. And it, okay. it was, it was the year after superior had 93% ice coverage. Um, so we were diving in, in August and at 17 feet, it was two degrees warmer than like it was, I think we were, I think at 17 feet, we were 43 degrees Fahrenheit. So like less than four degrees Celsius. And it was just, it was absolute misery. Painful. Um, when we did it in 2016, <laughs> we had 60 degrees, you know, down to 90 feet. So we were, we were doing run times of like 45 minutes on the locomotive. So we had a, you know, we had the gas supply and we had the, the benefit of much warmer decompression. So, you know. I, I would I would have loved this train to have been in 45 feet of water. It would have been awesome. <laughs> so much easier. Do we have any other questions that are live? I don't see any in the chat. I do want to make the... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ro. I was going to make one comment that I learned in the last five or so years. Canada's infrastructure for getting data across this country was just like it was back in the early days. We didn't have a complete data sovereignty across Canada. A lot of our internet traffic would travel from, for example, Montreal, Toronto, into the United States, across the United States and to come back out into our West Coast. And the parallels with the, the railroad, you know, the uh, Mary Uskad Mer from sea to sea, uh, I found very inspiring by watching that uh, ties up bind. I really am glad that you showed that historical a part of the shipwreck or the, the wreck itself, not the shipwreck, but the wreck itself. So that's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, it, it certainly, it certainly adds weight, you know, otherwise it's just, it's just another piece of steel on the bottom of Lake Superior, but uh, it was, it was Tom McClellan and it, basically him and the family and they just, they just did it for the Canada 150. And when they did that, they asked 
if they could use some of my footage. And I said, yeah, it's, you know, I'd gladly donate it if you would let me give me permission to show the ties of buying. Because I said it, it just it it closes the circle yeah. so nicely and really puts puts some color to it. But uh, the, I think the last thing is, you know, and Tom, you know, Tom's Tom's from the Lake Superior area as well. You know that if you know a lot of people in Ontario just have no idea the drive from the from Sioux to the Wawa and then around that North Shore Superior, you honestly think you're in a completely different country because it is absolutely gorgeous. So you know, uh, if you get that opportunity, great. definitely do it. You know. Great. Well, Terry, I, I don't want to cut us short, but I know yep. that it's quite late yep. and uh, I, I'm, I enjoyed it myself and it's been recorded. So those who missed it will be able to see it. Uh, you've certainly outdone uh, the last presentation that you did for us on the Seabrands. <laughs> so uh, I, I really appreciate that. And I'm really glad that you invited Tom to come because there's another uh, person that can add to the story that you've yep. taken us on. Yeah. So really thanks, thanks for coming on, Tom. That was great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, that was great. So uh, again, thank you. Maybe what I can do is I'll just uh, see if there's any last questions from the floor because I don't see any on the the chat. I see lots of people thanking you as well. So that's great. Well, thanks for having us. That's awesome. Harry, did you did you leave the line in place? Yeah, the line is yeah the line is there. Um, when we were up, um, I don't know if we got on it last summer. The last time I was on it, there's a couple of sections of line that are that have broken. So our next our next uh, trip to it, we will um, we will we'll want to repair that line. You know, because was we we ironically the the line that you saw in the video the the polypropylene line when we dove it and i know tim ran's on this and i can't remember tim if we dove that yeah okay tim answered thank you we we did get on it last summer because i knew it was relatively recent so there still was a line up on it but we always wanted to have that cave line because we can always find the bogey wheels if we can find the bogey wheels we can follow the cave line down to the wreck just in case you know that that line drops so nice thank you yeah Great. All right. And again, thank you for joining us uh, to our guests and to our special presenters. And, and Tom, thank you for joining us. Thank uh, you. Always welcome people coming and sharing information like this. Thank you for joining us and stay healthy, everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Have good a night. good night.